So I've been, um, you know, I'm, I, I've been a provocateur in, in the past, and um, the, this shall continue. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose that um, the brain is con is basically consists of something slightly larger or, or uh, more elaborate than just the neocortex. I mean, it would be sort of interesting, perhaps, to, to ask the question, I mean, we have high throughput now technologies, um, but while I did see the striatum, though it wasn't really discussed, uh, in, in your slides, Mike, uh, and, and I did see, you know, a, a bit of, uh, I, I think, I, I thought I saw some, some uh, thalamus, potentially, at least listed, um, which are nice, uh, nice structures, not cortical, but um, I, I would like to throw this, this question out there. Um, you know, let's say um, that my belief system is that um, the cortex is the umbrella of the actual brain. Um, uh, take it from there, you know, take me down. Tell me why I'm wrong. How would you take this one, Jan? Well, what strikes me is, of course, that yes, uh, there is a challenge in neuroscience sometimes that uh, it's, uh, it's about the cortex and then one, one cortex and <laughs> not the other Well, cortices. hippocampus also is very, you know, uh, popular and uh, amygdala and few uh, other structures, so uh, yeah. it's not and just And then the you have a cerebellar community. Yeah. <laughs> who, owns who owns most of the neurons, right, in the brain. Um, and uh, we have a lot of very strange things going on in terms of how the brain is organized, how it is connected, what parts are connected with very, very dense projections and, and surprisingly thin or, or weak projections between enormous regions. Mm. And, and th these are very puzzling questions that I think uh, you probably are thinking about in this regard. <laughs> Mm. Well, what we really are missing is the brainstem, because there are very few research on the brainstem, and this is such a crucial structure for homeostasis and keeping us alive, that uh, if you talk with neurologists, they say, okay, uh, the death is not just the cardiac <laughs> arrest, it's just the brainstem stopping functioning. That's how they define the death case. So, so yeah, so I mean, we are too much focused on the well, external of course, part of the to, brain. To, to defend the cortical people, I, I guess we can say the neocortex makes us human, so... Well. But at the same time, the brain has a number of functions that needs to be understood as a whole. But it also makes the macaques macaques and marmosets marmosets. <laughs> Not quite true, actually, because as we know, the uh, this limbic structure are cr crucial for the typical behavior of animals. So. Yeah. I just wanted to add, you've probably seen, you heard of these results of these re really remarkable studies that people do that, you know, that, that without input from lower brain structures, you can't really make decisions, right? You yes. can't, in fact, you may have met people like this, they probably don't have those, you know, but, but they, they, you can't, you can generate alternatives but you can't, in fact, break ties, and, and be, that requires a form of emotional lower kind of thing, and that, that's quite remarkable. I mean, it there are also a few papers showing that people who don't have practically cerebral cortex actually still can behave in many ways, which just, uh, when you look from outside, you think that they're normal people, yeah. although many functions are gone. Right? Zombie agents. Zombie agents. <laughs> So um, I also mentioned in, in Japan then for the, the large scale brain simulation um, projects they're interested in not just the cortex but the interaction between cortex sub subcortical structures cerebellum and in, in terms of um, data structure this is also another a point so if you can if you consider that you can lay out the cortex into a flat 2D surface uh, this is very nice for distributed um, computations but how you deal with um, and, and also because of the, the large number of um, neurons in the cortex and cerebellum. So, so how do you actually organize the data structures? I guess um, subcortical structures are nuclei. There are less neurons. This is not so much of a challenge, but you also have to consider that. So that, that's just from the simulation perspective. What I might add to that, that in terms of 
map transformations in the brain, as you say, the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum can be dealt with in a kind of 2D fashion, whereas the intermediate stages are 3D. And uh, we worked on that with local coordinate system as being very helpful, and I think these, these type of mappings are also explaining a lot about what, what happens. Yeah. And then we have a lot of small nuclei in the brainstem which are actually providing lots of neurotransmitters, really changing the way the brain works. So, uh, lots of things to be done. More questions, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask uh, you about uh, this uh, quite old uh, uh, structure by Uria, it means you know this name, Uria, who um, <coughs> divided uh, a brain into three blocks. And this uh, theory is quite uh, well, because we, someone uh, mentioned about hippocampus, someone mentioned about neocortex, and we uh, still, uh, I think we still should work uh, in this scheme, because there is a so-called neuropsychology and also this uh, uh, neuro, um, neuro, science, uh, neuro psychology linguistic. It means this is a, a, new, a, a linguistic psychology on the level of, uh, of a brain, coming, for example, from Chomsky's idea of uh, uh, grammars and uh, uh, all of these uh, linguistics problems. Because really, uh, brain, human brain, is in the moment where we are able to construct a language. It means we have a linguistic, for example, in Chomsky idea. And what is the, now what is the uh, st stay of this uh, investigation in the simulation of brain, uh, of brain working or, or so on? Well, I, I, my, my general comment to the question would be that there are many such schemes during history that are used to, let, let's say, at a very high level, create theories about brain regions and how things are connected and how they work, and you use different languages to, to then tell a story about the brain. I, I think that's, that's fine. Uh, what, what's probably now interesting is to look at how all the different observations, the data we have, map onto such uh, schemes, and then maybe some are useful, some are not. I think most of them are absolutely, totally unusual, or no use, in my opinion. Uh, I usually do not think it's helpful to parcel a brain into two st strict regions. Yeah. It's basically made up of uh, networks and, and, and very distributed functions. That was a bit quiet. Uh, there is lots of work on, on neuroscience of language, of course, and people are, are doing really very nice research also, uh, looking at uh, neuroimaging, etc. So, But uh, I haven't seen anyone really linking that to Chomsky. <laughs> Maybe you've seen that, but I don't think that, that Chomsky is relevant to neuroscience in a way. I think uh, it is, because Chomsky idea is really a Chomsky linguistic is uh, supported by psychology, by this uh, uh, grammars and also by something which is called uh, fundamental grammar. Yes, well, in popular literature, there is lots of, you know, uh, um, descriptions of this sort. I'm, I'm talking about neuroscience literature and what we are talking about here. I haven't seen any paper in neuroscience journals linking uh, the neuroscience of language to Chomsky. So that's the fact, right? The fact that psychologists talk about that and other people talk about that doesn't change that. Yeah, next question, please. There is also neuropsychology linguistic by Uria. There is a quite big... That, that was a century ago. We're, we're not discussing historical <laughs> papers here. <laughs> okay. So, so the brain develops over a, you know, several weeks or months from a, a neural tube and expands out and, and you've gradients of gene expression that determine uh, cell identity, based on like modeling of that process about gene networks and, and, and uh, uh, gradients of expression, is there any theoretical or simulation based result that would suggest that there should be clusters that you should be able to identify? I mean, because like it seems like it's a it's a question you're asking with data, which is which is which is great. But is there is there any like good like model that would suggest what you should find when you look at that? There's not much. I don't think much theoretical. <laughs> work there that that's thing I don't I don't also have a I have a sort of a 
I'm a skeptic, kind of, in a way, of things in general. I mean, I kind of like, like all, we, we, you see groups, okay? You can do all kinds of fancy things. You can justify groups statistically. But the question is, do they really do something? And, and I mean, I, I have this weird fig feeling that I, I, wanted, I wanted to kind of see if I could, uh, the idea occurred to me to see if you could prove a, some kind of a theorem like this. The, in, in, in a sufficiently complicated, here, I'm gonna, this is very informal, here's a challenge that, that, that I think would be fun to try. In a sufficiently complicated system with some sort of birth-death process or whatever, et cetera, and certain rules, I don't know what they are yet, that the, the system, if you, and, and, and you evolve it using, we're gonna bring back genetic algorithms. You evolve it just like a gen, using some kind of genetic algorithm. And I'd like to argue that, that the types that result, that inherently there's going to be a bunch of pathological types that don't do anything in the system. And I, 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 cl I wanna claim that any system evolving according to uh, natural selection would produce such a thing. Now maybe that's nonsense, I don't know, but. But anyway, I think that's... What do you think about that? Well, well, one step back. I think the question is the right type of question to ask with regard to all the data we are collecting. And for example, now with mic systems, you, you, you can hopefully go back and actually ask questions along these lines and talk, investigate yeah. um, over time. Um, just some other topic where development plays a role. Parcellation of the brain, areas, sub-areas, uh, and so on. Development helps a lot. Uh, also topography. Uh, projection systems, popularly now given all kind of fancy names such as connectomes, whatever you have. But th they also follow very often very developmental principles and if you trace back how they are formed, uh, you get back into the story you're aiming to. And I think again, the data sharing part of this, having access to data, mm -hmm. uh, doing the dinosaur story over again, mm -hmm. that, that's what we want to have in the, in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions around? Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. So, I mean, this is exciting work, and as someone who's always kind of done cellular-based type models, so it's really exciting to see all this data coming out. And so, I mean, I guess what I, I've read and seen before, I think it was in Sebastian Sung's article about the cell types have to be associated with some function or, you know, circuit, and this is a challenge, right? So at least if we kind of could be clear about as is going to come out of this data, then you know mapping it onto function, right? So you might you know so you have VIP positive cells, but there's you know ten different types of those. So you know, but certain types might be active when elements moving and stuff. So it has to kind of mm -hmm. the experiments have to kind of go along with you know being able to know that you're talking about that particular cell type that can be identified during during you know whatever behavior, and then those are really challenging experiments, right? But at least if we have the data that you guys are producing and sort of classifying, then you can sort of ask these questions more specifically. So that's what's sort of in my mind really exciting, right? So I mean, the cell type will come from that combined work. Um, is is you know so any of these sort of development questions, neuromodulation questions, the state of the system, right? It's all going to depend on that, right? But at least if we can sort of be clear about, you know, the genetic, you know, all those transcriptomics, at least that's kind of like a base start. That's kind of how I view it. Is that fair to say, or I, I, as someone who's not an expert in, you know, this, that sort of is that seems reasonable. Fair? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone wants to comment on that? That was a long comment. No opinion. Agree. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's it's well. I mean, one of the most interesting questions, at least for me, is is at which level do you think we will understand uh, how the brain works in general terms, which would be, for example, useful to well create a better artificial intelligence systems and other things like that, because obviously when you look at the cells, it's extremely important to pharmacology, to our understanding of molecular medicine, etc. I mean, what goes wrong with the particular cell uh, may have a very particular uh, expression uh, in uh, all kinds of mental disease, etc. But maybe this is not the level which we really need to understand general working of the brain. So what, what do you think will be the proper level uh, for a description that we still could use words for that, uh, not just huge data sets, right? And, and be able to have the feeling that we roughly understand what the brains are doing and why they're doing it this way. 
Marianne and I were talking about this, something similar the other day. Yes. Is that you know I, I wonder you know it depends what your motivations are, right? I mean, it, there's at least two big motivations. Let's say there's many, possibly many, for studying the brain. But one, let's say, the broadest ones for me is that you want to understand how how people think, and you want to know potentially how to build something even more sophisticated. Let's say that's one motivation. And the second is disease. You, you really want to help human suffering and human disease. And, and I, I'm not so interested in the, well, it's just fun motivation. I find that it's too expensive and it's too hard. To, 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 there's other ways to have fun. So I don't really buy that, that one so much. And so for me, the two biggest motivations are probably those two. And you know, take for example, it, it may be that, like I was saying, it may be that the I mean, the whole molecular context of the brain only gets you so far in terms of understanding how you think, right? And, and the, it, it's, it's intimately connected with the disease. I mean, that's unequivocal, but I, I just don't, it, the question is, could something much simpler than what we are do as well? I mean, that's one question. So I, I, I think that you have to, we have to understand what you're interested in in the question and, and acknowledge that that understanding the brain means different things to different people, right? Um, we hear so often that we don't understand the brain. Right. And then some of us think, well, but we do understand something. Yeah, right? <laughs> so yeah. Un understanding at very different levels. And I suppose yeah. in modeling, you refer to multi-scale modeling as, as a key aspect there, that it, it's really very different. And one of the challenges there, perhaps of some relevance to the question, is actually to connect those modeling efforts uh, also at the level of tools and simulations. That's somehow not directly what we're discussing, but some people think that's a related question. Okay, so on this fundamental note, Alex has the last word, <laughs> word and uh, then Matthew will just close the <laughs> conference. I was just going to add that um, understanding intelligence, I think, is not just about understanding the brain, so you, you, you can extend this out to understand the entire organism, organism and, and so on. So I think, yeah, that, that's also very important.